John, where it's always yeah, double drilling, no canteen. Guy. He'll be squatting on the see. coals with the Go rest of the poor damn souls, and I'll get this a swig in hell from Gunga Dean. <laughs> dean, 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 you lacerated leather Gunga Dean, though I've belted you and flayed you. By the living God that made you, you're a better man than I am, Gunga Dean. <laughs> All right. Again, again. <laughs> I got that. Okay, we are. Okay, you ready? Basil is a word that means you're too tight. To put you down, an art critic will refer to you as facile. I'm a facile raconteur. Art is defined as the expression of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form such as painting or sculpture. The work of Robert Williams pushes this definition to its abstract limits. Born in 1943, he grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico and experienced the 1950s hot rod culture firsthand. At a very early age, he showed a propensity for drawing and painting. In 1963, realizing he was heading for trouble, he moved to California to get an education and become an artist. He attended Los Angeles City College and Chouinard Art Institute. In 1964, he viewed an exhibition of Salvador Dali's work at the Los Angeles Municipal Art Gallery. The event had a profound effect on Williams and set him on a path to one day hold his own exhibition in the same gallery. During that long journey, he worked for Ed Big Daddy Roth, was among the first wave of underground artists in Zap Comics, founded the number one selling art magazine in America, had his painting and its title used on the first release of Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, and was referenced in a song by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. published over a dozen books, and had sold out shows all over the country. He was the subject of a full-length documentary entitled Robert Williams, Mr. Bitchin, that premiered at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. In 2015, 51 years after viewing the Dolly paintings, he achieved his goal of exhibiting at the same LA Municipal Gallery. His show, entitled Slang Aesthetics, set the highest recorded attendance in the gallery's history with over 20,000 visitors. In 2019, he again broke attendance records at the Bellevue Arts Museum with Robert Williams, the father of exponential imagination. The exhibition was accompanied by a giant career-spanning tome of the same name. Now, Robert Williams is still painting, designing sculptures, and hot-rodding around Los Angeles. He's also a true raconteur. No one tells a story like Williams. Okay, I'm just a little kid, and I get into comic books, you know, I'm like eight or nine, and I like pictures, and I've always been an artist. I always attracted to comic books for pictures, and I learned to read the comics. And there was one set of comics called Entertainment Comics, EC Comics, that were just fucking exceptionally well-drawn and well-written. And it was just a lot of blood and guts and sexual innuendo, and I just took right to that. I started painting in oil paints in 57, so I got quite a bunch of time on it. I went to art school in the early 60s, me and Suzanne, and uh, you had to be an abstract expressionist. I was immediately called the illustrator. 
people would make fun of me because I stood in front of an easel with an arm palette, you know, like a classical painter, and I was silly. come to California in 63, I tried desperately to stay away from hot rods and motorcycles. The last thing I wanted was to get back in the hot rod world. I was trying to straighten myself up to be a gentleman. And I went to the unemployment agency and they said, well, we don't have anything for you. And they said, well, we got one thing, but when we send people down there, the conditions are dirty and everything. I said, well, what is it? And they go, well, this is an art director for Red Big Daddy Roth. I said, give me the phone. So I went down there and he looked at my portfolio and he says, well, you know, if I knew you were alive, I'd have hunted you up. So I uh, get this job with Ed Big Daddy Roth, and I was his art director doing the ads, and so that, that worked out really good. a series of paintings in the 60s they were very tight and I was fortunate enough to find a collector that I could sell them to but no gallery would show me no magazine would reproduce them There's museums wouldn't touch me I was just like a an odd bird so I kept at it My mind is poisoned with comic book art and pulp covers and B-movie posters and girly magazines, you know, and it just really doesn't look like there's a place for me in the fine arts world. But then I met uh, Stanley Mouse, a psychedelic poster artist, Rick Griffin, and, and through them, I met Gilbert Shelton and then Robert Crumb got me into Zap Comics. <laughs> so then the punk rock movement comes along and I'm, I'm friends with Gary Panner and a bunch of these guys, uh, George Ann Dane, a bunch of punk rock artists. And I realize, you know, they're, they're, they're having these art shows at night in these venues where they're using art shows uh, after hours cover to sell alcohol without a license. And the artwork is just any kind of shit you can do. So I figure, well, you know, uh, I know anatomy and I can paint pretty fast. I can do some real gratuitous sex and violence and make it look hammered out. So I started a series of paintings called Zombie Mystery Paintings. And I had this giant following overnight from obscurity to all of a sudden this old man, someone in this young bohemian group. But I was interested to do something that had an enormous amount of energy, and nothing has more energy than sex and violence, say. My artwork would not be appropriate if your pastor was coming to dinner. There is gratuitous sex and violence in my work, and I defend that by saying artists should be responsible for the entire human pathos of life. A picture's got to have a lot of energy, you know. You could start a car off one of my paintings. They even used the name for the painting was Appetite for Destruction. She did have her panties down around her ankle, and she did have one breast exposed. Now, there's a monster jumping over the fence to avenge her, see. I have not gone without avenging this graphic crime. I was talking to a gal that put out the tattoo magazine. She was doing an article on me. And I said, you know, we need a magazine just of this kind of art. We need, you know, like Surrealist Revolution magazines uh, in the 30s. Me and Suzanne and Greg Escalani and, and uh, Craig Stesick, we all got together. You know, we'll just do our own. 
I submitted a list of 125 names and they picked Juxtapose. Juxtapose started out the first issue was quarterly, so it sold really, really well, paid for itself. Every issue it sold better and better and better. Then it, then it surpassed the sales of Art Forum. Then it outsold Art in America. Then finally, after a year or two, it outsold a big one, Art News. So then this shitty little publication became the top-selling art magazine on planet Earth. Struggling in LA, you know, trying trying to get somewhere, do whatever I can, just become a known artist to make a living in the fine arts world. And then I run across Walter Hopps. Walter Hopps was the guy that got Andy Warhol his first show. I mean, he's the one that got me the gallery Tony Schifrazi in New York. I don't think there's such a thing as bad art. I think there's art you're interested in and art you're not interested in. Art, art is subjective. We function in an objective world and art is a subjective fantasy world, you know. To fuss over rights and wrongs in art is like trying to apprehend a fart in a, an Apache dream catcher. Being the bottom of the barrel, I can still see a lot of light, say. Spreading my legends like trying to stretch a prophylactic over the mouth of a mason jar. <laughs> 